He's joined already or? Uh, yes, yes, we are all here, we are all here, sir. Yeah, yeah, but I can only see, you know, uh, six of people. Yes, uh, yes. Our videos hello. switched How are you? Off, so. you are Jelena, is it? Jelena. Yes, Jelena. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I'm Jelena. I will be the Jelena. moderator for the day. Sir. All right. So, Good evening. So where are you uh, based, Jelena, in, in Kerala? I, uh, I am from Ernakulam, sir. Pardon me? Anaklum? Okay, Anaklum. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay so... Shall, yes, shall we begin? On, yeah? yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Good evening, yeah. all of you. Uh, I'm so happy and I'm proud to have Dr. Shahid Amin here uh, for today's lecture. He needs no introduction. I'm going over to uh, pass the mic, the session to Dr. Uh, to Jelena Anthony. He's, he's our MPhil scholar and she's working on myth, literature and history locating mm -hmm. Ashtamala in the literary traditions of early 20th century Kerala. Over mm -hmm. to be the moderator. Thank you, Shiva Man. A very good evening and a warm welcome to the sixth session of the International Online Workshop conducted by the Department of History, Sri Shankara University of Sanskrit Kaladi in association with Kerala Council of Historical Research. My name is Jelena Anthony and I am an ENFIL scholar in the department. The running theme of this webinar is Sensing the Past, Thematic Departures and Archival Searches. This webinar seeks to interact with renowned historians and social scientists who have distinguished themselves in conceptualizing historical processes, identifying new sets of sources, or appropriating lesser known ones. Today, we have with us one of the most distinguished scholars to talk on this aspect, Professor Shahid Ami. Before we move on to the formal proceedings, a set of general instructions for the participants. All the participants are requested to mute their audio throughout the session. Please mark your attendance in the Google form, which will be circulated in the chat box shortly. Also, if you have any queries, please type them into the chat box. I will be reading it out to the speaker on your behalf right after the lecture. Now, to formally introduce the speaker and for the welcome address, I invite Surya Krishna, another MPhil scholar in the department. Over to you, Surya. Hello, good evening. Hello. It's my privilege Hi. to welcome all of you to the sixth session of the international webinar series conducted by KCHA and the Department of History, Sri Shankaracharya University of Sanskrit Kaladi. Today, we have Professor Shahid Ami, an eminent historian who was the former professor at the University of Delhi. We are really fortunate to have you here, sir. He will be talking on walking in and out of the archives. Professor Shahid Amin has been a fellow assistant for the Center, Shelby Kalam Davis Center, Princeton University and the Institute of Advanced Studies, Berlin, visiting professor at the University of Chicago and Columbia University, Rajini Kothari Chair at CSDS Delhi, and visiting research professor D.D. Kosambi Chair, Goa University, a founding member of the Subaltern Studies Collective, his publications include Event Metaphor Memory Chauri Chaura, edited a concise encyclopedia of North Indian peasant life and writing alternative histories, A View from India. His most recent work is Conquest and Community, The Afterlife of Warrior Saint Ghasi Mian. He has co-edited Nimna Vargiya Prasan, Dark Ek Ordo, and also authored the Hindustani dialogue of the feats of feeling Karwan, directed by Pankaj Bhutali, chairing Nasiruddin Shah. I welcome the distinguished speaker of the day, Professor Shahid Amin, to deliver the lecture. Welcome, sir. I also welcome all of the participants to the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is uh, audible or should I speak a bit louder? Can you hear me? Sir. Yes, sir, you are audible. All right. You All right. Start, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, 
I have uh, been to, to Kerala uh, twice and have really been really struck by the, uh, the kind of intellectual dialogues and participation that takes place there. My first encounter, which was a very, very pleasant one, was to be invited to the DC Lit Festival. Uh, and that was incredible because in North India, we never have, we don't have something like, like that, where people, you know, not from the university, but from all walks of life, come and, and, and discuss and listen to uh, uh, scholars and, and others. Uh, I, I also must apologize to, to some of the organizers earlier on, uh, whose invitation I could not uh, take. And so uh, I was really looking forward to coming to Kerala uh, uh, this time, but I did not know that I will have to confine myself to speaking at a black view uh, in person. Um, let me begin uh, by uh, a little talk uh, that, uh, well, uh, well, I'll be talking mainly about North India, and I realize that that is an imposition who is not from North India. In fact, you know, in the, in the North, we we'll refer to uh, the lands uh, south of India as peninsular. I think the exact opposite of that is and should be insular, uh, because to a great extent, North India is a very, very insular entity as far as most of us are concerned. Uh, we just hone in and uh, do our research, read other people who, who work on it, Uh, known Professor Panikar uh, now for exactly 50 years. <laughs> I've lost your connection. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Sanal uh, and I, we met up at a, at a, at a, at a conference. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm very pleased to be here in, uh, by some preliminary um, observations. Uh, I, and, and let you, uh, and, and kind of put it before the, the kind of uh, main themes that I shall uh, be touching. I'll, I'll begin with a little, uh, you know, uh, uh, rumination on the word archive itself, uh, and then uh, move on to when I start to the archive, I'm basically looking at or talking about state archives. To, uh, you know, uh, in North India. So I'm talking about, uh, while I talk generally about archive and what way in which we can expand its meaning, uh, some of my preliminary observations are going to be on, on proper, proper uh, archives. For instance, if you have to go to national archives, you are frisked even before uh, you enter, you get a pass. There's a home ministry guard who looks at you. So this is a kind of a, what is on record at a national level is preserved. Yes, but it also a special sense. So, so I'll be talking about what does it mean to enter this archive, which means not just physically, but actually engage with the kind of material uh, there is. And I'll be confining myself basically to the Indian colonial period. I'll say something, uh, you know, or, or, or evil, uh, archives of a different sort. And uh, I'll, I'll say something about, you know, why is it that, relatively speaking, you know, the, the craft and the products of contemporary history in India are, are really uh, uh, not really comparable. What is it that makes the kind of research that we have on colonial India or even uh, medieval in India, yeah, the early in, early India, uh, uh, much more exciting. While it comes to uh, contemporary India, people uh, largely, to a great extent, because the state is so niggardly, the the post-colonial state is so very possessive about the record of how it has administered all of us, that uh, most of the uh, writing on uh, the contemporary period, post fifties, sixties uh, period is really confined to newspapers and books written by participants. 
Uh, then I shall then move to uh, the uh, kind of mainstream uh, uh, sources that people normally look at and talk about uh, in the archive, basically political history, and then engage with some of uh, the newer questions. Do we need new sources for the writing of new history? Or is it that we exhaust sources? Normally in small town, you know, if you see one sort of file, then people say, well, 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 nobody else can work on it because as it is that you've consumed the archive. So uh, basically, if we are trying to write a newer kind of history of people, you know, uh, who sell, who produce goods and services, not documents. There are some people who are in the business of producing documents. Uh, state functionaries and, and, and officials are. The others, large number of people that I will be talking about, are those who, who don't produce documents, who don't write, who are written about. So uh, if we are to engage in an attempt to write their history, and a lot of us uh, have been trying to write, you know, people's history or history from below, uh, do we, uh, are, we, there is a sense of dissatisfaction that the official records are not enough. And therefore, let's turn to a completely new uh, kind of records, new kind of uh, way of research. Uh, so we really need, in a certain sense, if I was to give a slogan, uh, new sources for new history. I shall argue that uh, that stands, uh, that is important, because every new work on unknown or little known areas also shows uh, kind of brings to light new new sources. Uh, but uh, I shall be complementing this with the fact that both for traditional old sources and new sources, we cannot really, as historians, allow the sources to speak. Hmm? Uh, because as historians, it's not simply a question of the judge and balancing this against the other. Both these kind of new, new kind of sources uh, popularly generated sources and officially state generated sources, you know, are linguistic uh, statements. Uh, they are available to us in writings, of shorter bits of writing, very long bits of writing, and we cannot just reproduce them because we in the in the quest for authenticity, or the idea that the nearer the source is to the event or the process uh, being uh, talked about. Uh, the more authentic uh, uh, it is. So that we have to not only uh, read the sources in, in a way which might be different from the way it was written to be read. You know, official uh, uh, accounts really, uh, sometimes when they are published, uh, they are called a digest. Literally, it is for the officials to digest. They consume it with a view to carrying on with their uh, fu basic function of relating to and ruling uh, uh, and administering uh, the people about whom knowledge uh, has been generated. So there is a lot of talk about leaving, uh, reading against the grain, uh, reading things into it. I mean, I'll, I'll make a larger arguments, uh, argument that uh, we have to engage uh, with uh, the, the way statements or larger sections of, of a dialogue or, uh, or, or, or outpouring uh, are structured, so as to find out how meaning is generated within this for those it is intended for. And, and normally, these documents are not intended for the historian. The politicians might rhetorically say, you know, when the historian writes, but especially for contemporary uh, India, very little sources are really left for historians to look at and, and write, especially at the research level of our, uh, you know, newer uh, students, PhD students and so on. I mean, there is sometimes, you know, when you look carefully about at the, at the way, you know, the documents have been deployed, uh, one gets the impression, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit, that sometimes 
uh, you know, new scholars or, or younger scholars or who, those who be believe in absolutely authenticity of official sources or the nearest to the event, they end up actually, in effect, not writing one sentence per bit of archival fact, one sentence per bit of archival self. Now, now you're, you're, you're quoting the governor general, now you take the secretary, now you perhaps now quote what Gandhi had to say in response to it. You know, so the sentences really are really engaging with different kinds of statements, which, so there's not really, the historian is not really clubbing these together in, shall, shall we say, in, in his or her own statement. Uh, so there is a way in which, you know, we are ending some time up. We end up with reproducing the language of the judge, reproducing uh, the language of the police officer, reproducing the language uh, of the administrator, especially with administrator, especially with dealing with official judicial records. We often would come across uh, statements which will go something like, on this, perhaps it is best to quote the judge because the judge is there, all the evidence was put before him or her, and he, uh, as a judge, has evaluated it. And, you know, uh, that is the authenticity of that uh, piece of, uh, or, 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 or tract of, of judgment. And we just, you know, put the authority of the judge in front in such a way that it gets validated, uh, even in terms of a perspective that is very different uh, from the historian. So, you know, I'm, and, and sources, uh, you know, uh, let me put it this way, that when, in, in a manner of speaking, uh, when somebody uh, reads uh, a work of history, or a PhD thesis, or when that person or candidate writes it, there is, when you're reading, there is a movement of the eye from the bot top of the page to the bottom, you know, which, where the evidence lies um, in, in a kind of a, it's open, it's, it, it, it is not hidden, uh, it is the signal that validates uh, what is being said. Uh, in the text. So as we move our eye from top of the page to the bottom, you are in fact satisfied that you can give assent, you can agree that what is being said in the text is actually based on solid or good enough evidence. So that, that's why historians uh, work uh, must have, uh, do have uh, very, very copious uh, footnotes and normally earlier on now things have changed that these footnotes are really footnotes on the same <clears throat> page because somehow when we read a work of history there is always this uh, question at the back of the mind of the reader that is this based on authentic uh, information is this sentence really um, uh, truthful enough or or faithful enough to what it is purporting to describe in terms of the authority uh, that uh, the, the historian is bringing uh, to this statement. Meaning, I am, uh, that's a provocative statement, but I'm saying that, you know, uh, works of history, uh, if they have to be uh, crafted uh, in new ways, and I'm, I'm going to argue now and also in the discussion uh, that the historian is in the business of crafting, bringing things together, you know, as raw material and producing something which is not simply a replica of the raw material. The raw, raw material has been shaped, has been crafted, has been presented, has been showcased, has been, you know, provided so as to appear as an entity which is not the sum total of the statements and the footnotes at the back of the page. So, so those are, you know, uh, uh, you know, some of the broader uh, uh, issues that I'll raise in the, in, in the first uh, section of, of my uh, lecture. 
And then I'll, I'll, that is the kind of work that you are, figuratively speaking, doing inside the archive. Huh? And, uh, and I, I'm arguing also that unless one is going to rely on completely official sources, which may be adequate and very good and necessary and the best thing to do if we are discussing policy decisions, uh, for instance, if you are discussing you know, Lord Curzon's you know, policy on archaeology, on, on land revenue, it's perhaps best to quote Lord Curzon. Uh, or when you are dealing with the relations uh, between the Viceroy and the Secretary of State, uh, you, know, you can't be do better than, than quote what they are writing to each other officially. Or perhaps you can then go behind the scenes, as it were, and look at their private papers, you know, where things that have not been put on record uh, are available. So the check is, is this. Uh, what I'm talking about, so one is very much inside the archive in that sense. Straight generated production of documents so as to enable the state to perform its function adequately, efficiently, very, very cheaply, uh, of which, which is the business of the state, is to deal with either subjects, which, were, which all of us were, uh, or relate to citizens that we're all supposed to be in a post-colonial situation. And we can discuss that the very status nature of these interrelations uh, sometimes mean that the distinction between being a subject and a citizen is not very, very uh, clear. Earlier on, uh, because we were subjects uh, and not uh, agents or not citizens, that's why, in some ways, if you think about it, Gandhi talks about the wrongs. The state has wronged us. Huh? We don't really have claims. Uh, we are at the mercy of the state to its benevolent uh, self. And by certain action, it wrongs us. And there's no, no official or regular or, or fruitful channel of undoing this wrong by, by, shall we say, stopping its operation midway. And legislation is passed, hmm? newspaper articles, editorials, dharnas, and so on today take place. And since it is normally passed, suppose, in the interest of people, that decision is delayed or, 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 or just, you know, uh, done with, uh, canceled. I'm then moving from archives to what I will call historical fieldwork historical fieldwork and not just fieldwork. Uh, that's the difference between a historian and an anthropologist. For the historian, the event, I'm using it as a short term to what has happened in the past in a particular situation. But the event is given. It is the pastness of the event. And the event is normally recorded in the archive, the state archive. Of course, you know, they are, it can be recorded uh, in a newspaper and so on. But if the official version and the most detailed version is in the, uh, in the archives. Event is given and it is, its givenness is that, uh, that it comes to us as historians with the stamp of authority, with the stamp of the, of the people, you know, who have commented firsthand or more authoritatively on that event. I'm being uh, very general at the moment, I'll try and be more specific. So that, so the historian, you know, uh, cannot uh, 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 just uh, do work, right on events that are taking place in the very act of writing history. In a way, the, there is a separation between the research that he's doing and the writing because he cannot create data he cannot create information in the very business of scribbling in the archive. I mean, he may or she may create new ways of looking at it, but not create quote-unquote facts, which is what is, is the business uh, of anthropologists. The anthropologists normally always write in what they call ethnographic present. That is the present when the anthropologist was, shall we say, in that village. When M. N. Srinivas writes about Rampura, or when he writes uh, about the remembered village, uh, 
uh, all that we will get very, very finely uh, grained analysis is what happens when he is there with the uh, characters uh, that he's describing. So the presence of the anthropologist creates the data uh, for analysis and writing for the anthropologist. Of course, the presence of the historian in the archive cannot create you know, the movement or the document. The, the historian discovers some little known event yeah, because it has taken place before and somebody else has perhaps written it in a, in, in a different fashion. So that is, so that to that extent, the historian is dependent, you know, both one on the pastness of the event, of course, and the fact that it's made available to us across time by some authority or some configuration that makes it available as a retellable uh, event, something that can be told perhaps in a different way, but which has already taken place. But, so that's, you know, in some ways my, some of my, you know, uh, ways of um, uh, breaking up uh, uh, and, and showcasing and, and, and talking about the first half uh, of uh, the title of the lecture, which is walking into the archive. Uh, I mean, we can debate and sorry, discuss you know, how do you, you know, look at documents, how do you read them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but in the in the archive, and then uh, I'm I'm going to give a little uh, kind of a not mantra but little kind of statement that uh, disappointed in work one archive, uh, it is the business of the historian to try and find another. Disappointed in one archive, which is normally the state archive. You know, you can't just go to your supervisor if you are writing the history of very, very ordinary uh, people in the area that you are familiar with, in the area whose language you are familiar with, the terrain you are familiar with. You just can't say, sir, I didn't get the material I wanted uh, in the file. Uh, well, that can lead you to, to write a particular kind of standard history uh, that you are using a certain kind of private paper, a certain kind of records of proceedings of education department, you know, health, sanitary, or whatever it is. And, you know, you are constrained um, by the available evidence, as all of us are, uh, which means that you are also constrained by the uh, parameters uh, set by official uh, for the generation and, and documentation of records in that particular area of a society's uh, pastures. So, uh, but if you are, if you are trying to ask questions, which are not asked by the official, which are not the questions uh, that are staring you in the face to which very clear answers are available in those files, right? The title is such and such. And of course, it contains material uh, which justifies uh, that title. So that unless you are, uh, you know, one must, let me put it this way, one must try and resist the tendency of writing what could be called statist history. History written from the point of the state, which has generated a large documents that we invariably as historians, you know, have to rely on. But if you are asking uh, questions, which are your questions, which are not, you know, uh, they don't arise from the concerns of past concerns, of the, of the leaders or the dominant sections of the society or the past concerns of, of the administrators, then it is your business to try and create another kind of archive, try and create uh, evidence uh, that is not, you know, that kind of hard, hard evidence that say, Lord Curzon writing to the Secretary of State is. Uh, it's a tricky uh, terrain. People can just get uh, carried away. But I think it is important for all of us, you know, people who have, what shall I call myself, a retired historian, uh, <clears throat> as well as younger scholars, 
who are you know uh, writing their pieces. Sometimes you, you can't really, <coughs> excuse me, uh, do all sorts of things when you're writing a thesis because time is limited. But once you get your trade union card, shall we say, for uh, practicing history, writing history, the second work that you uh, pick up, uh, that's what I advise my students. The second work that you pick up, you know, should be more uh, ambitious in the sense that it should not be solely dependent on the official archive, depending, that is, if you are asking new questions. So I'm not saying that all PhD students at Delhi universities should ask questions which the archive does not provide answer to. No, no, no. You, you, there is a space for all sorts of writing of history. But I'm saying that if we are writing uh, or asking questions, which are new questions, difficult questions, which are not available uh, in, in a way uh, in which the dominant classes and the state uh, you know, uh, conceptualize or talk about uh, the society that they are dominating, uh, then you have to try and work your way out in such a way that what was not thought to be adequate government, what was not thought to be hard, uh, what was not thought to be uh, uh, reliable or verifiable, uh, it is then that certain newer uh, ways of asking questions of that material, presenting it, writing it up so as to disrupt the main uh, you know, status discourse, that can yield a newer kind of history. And that, if you look back at some of the major breakthroughs, uh, uh, that is what happens. Of course, a lot of it is looking at new, new sources, which were not thought to be sources. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, uh, has been a lot of work in, in Europe, especially in France, about the idea of death. Uh, for which, uh, or the idea of, uh, yeah, yeah, how do you, how do you think about your impending death, and how do you relate your death to your successors? So they look at wills and other testimonies uh, that that people leave behind. But you know, I am I am trying to push you uh, uh, through, uh, uh, you know, certain other questions that you know, perhaps are more generally germane to people uh, in, in our part of the country. And let me, uh, uh, before I you know, end this long prologue about what I intend to do, uh, which has which I've been talking now for, uh, for about half an hour, perhaps. Uh, I, I, let me say that uh, when I am not uh, going to present, you know, theoretical or methodological arguments based on people who have written about methodology or about the theory of history. I am trying to reflect again and present to you in a, uh, in a different uh, uh, form uh, the experiences uh, that I have gone through in, in some of the recent works uh, that I have tried to research and write, which is to write <coughs> about histories or people uh, or groups who are not fully visible uh, in the archive, or at least if they are visible, they are visible uh, through the lens uh, of the officials. So what I have to now um, say is actually, you could say that this is very uh, particularistic because you know it's based on your uh, experience, uh, but I think that uh, it's, uh, it's only, uh, proper for me uh, to talk about the archive walking in and out uh, if I also focus on how one gets in and how one gets out and what is the world uh, available of documents or interviews or, or of folk tales or fables or other language uh, products outside uh, that uh, uh, archive. One more uh, important thing I, uh, which I have, uh, which has really uh, made me think and accept uh, is uh, the uh, uh, rather um, you know, novel and therefore controversial uh, statement is that if you are, as a historian, asking newer questions which are disruptive, which, which just, you know, 
as as your question that have no space in the official uh, archive uh, then you have to also create a uh, uh, a kind of a um, idea of evidence which is also slightly new it might not be as firm as the official uh, documents but it is novel it really is an attempt to answer some questions uh, which are important but cannot be answered definitely hmm? so the novelty is that or, or the importance of these questions is that they are new and and they are such not just new but they are such that you, that they could not have been accommodated within the official process of document making that is to the ideas and aspirations of people uh, which do not find straight you know um, uh, uh, presence in the archive unless there is to say interrogation of, of, of a rebel or something so that, you know the id so you there might be a, a, a situation where if your readers are or within the historian community people ask for that definitive kind of proof which is available clear cut in the writing of a major administrator then it limits the possibility of your asking newer questions because the questions uh, asked then would be really enclosed or hemmed in uh, by the kind of evidence uh, that is available for certain kind of you know different question so that so not only are we we could talk about newer history newer sources and do they have to be absolutely new or there's new way of reading it but also uh, whether this newer kind of history writing which you know it's not readily available which we must struggle to at least i which uh, has to be done in its own way depending on 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 the issue uh, that one is interested in that in some ways newer kind of writing of history also creates not just new evidence but what is or what can be used profitably and usefully as evidence right uh, so uh, especially if it comes to belief past beliefs about saints or or, or whatever it is uh, how do you write about belief uh, in in a way which allows you to enter the world of belief uh, uh, without uh, which is not easy uh, but either you say we should not talk about beliefs of ordinary people then it's fine we are never going to find out about very very interesting things about how people believe what do they think uh, over a period of time what are the way in which they hold what might appear as contradictory uh, ideas like they 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 revel or they they think very highly of a person who might be a warrior uh, from another community uh, which uh, might make it uh, normally impossible to say well that is that is the case so if we have uh, anonymous situation ambiguous situations apparently contradictory situations that go to constitute uh, a fact like belief in a particular uh, saint then you know obviously uh, you have to have evidence but then you have to suggest and 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 showcase in your writing that that evidence is adequate to the question that is being asked that that question that you are asked you are asking either that is disallowed because you are saying no no get me that kind of hard evidence which means that you know the questions that we raise as historians are getting very limited or you are then providing a kind of evidence proof which is adequate to the way in which that bit of fact or that phenomena uh, can be uh, understood now about just 15 uh, more uh, minutes I've, i've i've left in some ways not deliberately but there are several openings uh, that are already there uh, in my presentation for people to 
uh, uh, engage uh, with. Uh, and now I'll, I'll just say a little bit about, uh, about what I call uh, historical uh, fieldwork. Historical fieldwork is an encapsulation of the title of what I've said, walking in and then out. Historical fieldwork, rather than fieldwork, is that you have been in the historical section of the past, which is the state section of the past. You have mastered that. You have complete control of that material for the story that you are telling. And now you are coming out, if it is a case of riot, something that I have worked on, a very notorious riot at Chori Chora. So you are marching out almost like a colonial policeman. Almost like a colonial policeman when you go to that area. Because you know the, uh, the, the, the people, they know about the past, you know about the social position, you know about the names of people who are tried as criminals, and, and that's, those are the people that you want to know more about in the area from which they came. So when I went to the villages around Chori Chora to talk about, to think about the limitation of the official writing, uh, what what does, what kind of memory uh, holds. You know, I will not be as productive. I will not be able to get a better understanding. I will not be able to fill my notebook or my tapes, the tape recorder, with material that is exciting, which is new, which requires greater meditation, which requires more thinking, which requires a different kind of writing, unless I go and talk to the relatives of the writers. I use the word relatives of the writers. If there's a person X who's important or who's been hanged, then I'm not just going to sit on a, on, a, on a chair like a district magistrate in a village and say, now tell me what happened. Uh, because that is to undercut uh, the conversation. You know, you are not there to extract information as a historian there. You have to have a certain, uh, you know, respect for what I've called the inheritors of the event, the sons and daughters and wives of people who are, you know, in the in the record of of the uh, trial of Chorichara, who are punished either with hanging or for long periods of time. So historical fieldwork is walking out of the archive, going into the field, but a full control as much as possible of the official material, so that then you can engage. This is the official material from which you also get a lot of quote unquote facts, names, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you talk and you try, which is the best thing if you can, very difficult, to enter into a dialogue. And you can enter into that dialogue because you are able to trigger their memory by mentioning something that is available about their area or about their relatives in the official records. So that you can then, you know, carry on a conversation in a dialogue. You say, okay, all right, the, you know, the state says, uh, the judge says this about so and so and oh, then they'll say, of course, of course, of course. But what it didn't say was this, right? So that it is not you go and say, okay, give me information. You are there in in a in a dialogic situation to enter uh, into a, a dialogue. So of course, uh, that dialogue will not erase the difference between you as a historian and say uh, the wife you know, of a writer, a quote unquote, uh, who was sentenced for, to eight years of prison. Erase the difference, of course. I, if you know, you have to speak in the dialect. And even when you speak in the dialect, that difference will not go away. Because your position as somebody from a higher social group will show itself in the way you are spoken to in the dialect. The use of the honorific, thou instead of you, right? So that, that, that difference will still remain. You cannot consume the peasant in the very process of writing a sympathetic history about him or her. The peasant, you are not the peasant, you write, I am not the peasant, 
that I'm writing at some length in my book on Chorikya. I am a historian who has got a slightly later access, but because I have a certain affinity uh, with the area, I speak the dialect. But that dialect, my attempt to speak the dialect, uh, will reproduce the way in which an, a, a lower subordinate person talks to a superior quote unquote person within the way in which they enter into a conversation within the dialect, right? In, in every, every language, there are what are called pronouns of power, right? Uh, when you address a superior, you use a particular mode of thou instead of you, uh, and the other way around. In fact, one of the um, uh, interesting features of any beginning of any resistance or rebellion is for the peasant to speak to the authorities in a way that the authorities are not used to. It could be abuse. It could be just saying you rather than Zu or sir. So, so what I'm saying is that uh, you know, being having done the research in in the archive that enables you to not just say what happened and, and just listen, uh, but you can actually uh, try and have a dialogue, a conversation, which would then help you create. Not material, but understand uh, the situation in your way. Let me give you, uh, yeah, let me again come with a provocative uh, statement which I've used in my book on Chori Chora, based on uh, uh, some more evidence than I can provide uh, over here. I write after discussing you know, this process of talking, listening, and how memories are triggered, and not simply by them. Uh, but I am, as a historian who looks, uh, you know, who has got a lot of information about that past, uh, which is not fully, you know, in their minds all the time, that you are able to trigger uh, something in their memory, which gives you additional and very, very interesting and important, important argument, uh, information. But uh, let me just say this, and uh, it is provocative, and I'm sure when you ask, uh, what 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 on God's uh, sake it means? I will try and elaborate. Let me say, uh, since I I you know I'm associated with the subaltern group, the subaltern makes their own memories, but not as they please. The subaltern make their own memories, but not as they please. This is kind of a play on Marx's famous uh, statement that man makes his own history, but not as he pleases, where there yeah, are constraints of the mode of production and so on. When I write, the subordinate makes his or her own history, a uh, memory, but not as she pleases. It is because what happened in the trial, whether a person was acquitted, hanged, or sentenced to long period of uh, incarceration, is a matter, literally a very, very important matter. So that that bit of official record is, shall we say, impacted in the brain or impacted in the memory of, say, a son or a wife. It, may, it makes the difference about whether the person was hanged or, or sent for long periods of time or betrayed, so that what might appear as idiosyncratic in what an old woman is saying to you. You may be able to figure out and say in the field, oh yes, this is why she's saying this. So that Naujadi, who is one of my main um, characters, for them, deliberately using it, um, character says, yes, there was a big meeting and 172 people gathered. Now, God said, not even in the kind of Bhatpuri Eastern UP uh, dialect that I'm familiar with, does the word, does the number 172 equal to a crowd? So uh, you would come back and say, oh, it's very strange. Uh, this woman says 172 when she was she was saying a, a large crowd or a small crowd. But if you've been, if you've really soaked yourself in with the 
uh, judicial archive, you will say, ah, very interesting. Because 172 is the number of peasants, writers, who are initially at the district level sentenced to death. That is reduced later on to 19 at the High Court. So 172 is impacted in the mind of person whose father or whose husband was going to be sentenced to death because he belonged or she belonged to a crowd of people that had gathered over there. Or they'll say, oh yes, 172 is written on my paper. Paper, that means the official statement by the post colonial state that so and so, son of so and so, uh, was and uh, or had uh, you know imprisoned for so many years. So that there would be 172 people who are initially condemned to death. Uh, uh, there, what happens in the high court? Either you know, 19 are are, are, are hanged rest have in, uh, in prison for various points of time. So it is the judgment first of the session courts where the palpable fact of their being about to be hanged in due course unless that is reversed and the high court still rings in the memory of the relatives or, you know, uh, or, or, or the fact that they are then released doesn't really take away from the fact that for six months, they, after the initial judgment, they were as good uh, as uh, death, uh, as dead. Uh, so, what I'm, I'm, I'm going to end soon. Um, that uh, I, huh, that this, I, I, it's very easy to say that you should have a dialogue. It's very difficult. You just turn up. As an outsider and say, look, look, I want to have a dialogue with you. I want to have a conversation about this right that was uh, jolly to me. Uh, well, you might not get any answer because, you know, the local radio station had been there because the right had been nationalized uh, in the 1950s. Uh, they were not criminals, but freedom fighters. Or, or some official might come who has no interest really in the lives of those people who just want some information for an official file. So why should people really you know, tell a lot of things uh, that are deep in their memory, that they can remember only when that is triggered? Uh, so you come back with, you, you, you don't have a conversation. You have some information that you gather uh, from, uh, from there. And, and I'm just repeating. Because I'm now then going to end on a, even a more provocative uh, statement. I'm just repeating that in order for historical fieldwork to really be meaningful, to really generate new material, to really help you write in new ways, you have to march outwards from the archive. If it's a ride to the site, to the villages where the people uh, came from. Uh, that I want to end with uh, the other uh, element or other mode of inquiry and writing that has not found any mention in what I've said, which is oral history. Uh, oral history or oral traditions. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, you know, but there are so many issues that arise uh, because oral history in some ways is tapping the memory of uh, somebody. Uh, and uh, there are limits to the questions you can ask. I Meaning they are being very, very gracious. They are going to, they are being very, very helpful when they agree to talk about their past. You have not, no business to go there and inquire about their uh, grand uncle or their husbands or, or whatever it is. There is a compact. There is a certain degree of, uh, uh, of kind of a, not sympathy, but there's certain kind of a rapport, uh, understanding uh, that 
uh, established, which yields the best kind of oral history. The one of the most formative, uh, fun, uh, most uh, important uh, oral historian um, has been a person called Alexandro Portelli, E O R T E L L I. Uh, Portelli has a very, very interesting formulation, which in a way relates to what I've been saying, uh, not, notably that I am not the peasant that I write about, that there is the distance, the paradigmatic basic difference between the historian, even if she is interested in the lives uh, of uh, people very different from her, that there is that dis distance of class, or social position and so on, that will not get uh, effaced because we are having a great uh, conversation. And what does, and, and, and Portelli puts it very, very interestingly provocative. He says, equality makes an interview possible. Equality makes an interview possible. That, you know, there has to be some level in which you are talking at a common level, not if you come as an authority, uh, then people, will either repeat what they want to hear, uh, or they will just shut up or, 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 or get away with the minimum uh, that is perhaps you are expecting. So, so equality, going out from the archive, knowing a little bit about, quite a lot about their past, showing that you are interested in that, um, makes the interview possible. Otherwise, it's not possible. So equality makes the interview possible it is difference. It is difference that makes it credible. Very proactive uh, proposition. Equality makes an interview possible that my dad would uh, we readily uh, agree to. Hmm? Because without that, interview is literally inter between two eyes meeting each other. Interview, you are actually, you know, uh, in, in eye contact uh, view. Is, is, is not writing, it's, it's sight. So um, how does difference make it credible? Because you are going to write a history that would have space, a major amount of space perhaps, for their experiences, for the way they have retailed their experiences. But it is not going to reproduce that. It is going to be a history written by a historian. Huh? Uh, as opposed to a long autobiographical, you know, uh, uh, recording uh, that somebody uh, might uh, do. Uh, even when, uh, uh, and the other thing is that you just cannot go and keep asking questions that they do not want to discuss or do not, uh, you know, want to give answers to. You have to stop. You know, the quest for new material cannot be at the price of doing away with the other person's, you know, uh, personality, with the other person's, you know, apprehensions and 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 fears, so that that is where you reach the outer limit of equality, the outer limit of listening carefully, because there are questions or there is you may have the possibility that in the conversation might create a situation you could say, all right, but why did he or she do this? But you realize that that is going and 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 really kind of a uh, into the sphere or into a situation that they would not ideally not like to talk about. So you cannot, shall we say, wring the truth, quote unquote, you know, from uh, uh, an interviewer. That is the job of a police that they literally wring, you know, uh, facts out, uh, you know, uh, in the extreme on, on the normally extreme case. Of, of, of beating up and so on. So that that thing, I mean, I have written about it in my in my book. And there are places where I actually on the tape I I hear myself mutter, "Now what do I ask now?" You know, where I realize that I carry about what they are because they're very very. So you got mute. Yeah, have I 
Have you been listening? No, no, no it's fine. Okay. So for half an hour, you have not heard. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I just saw that notice, so it must have. Uh, so your mic is muted again. I am not doing anything. Yes, now it's fine. Now it's fine. Just for a brief second. I'll raise my hands up here so that you know, <laughs> don't do anything. So, uh, you know, the best uh, example, very near uh, to us in a certain way in North India, is the experience of the partition of India, you know, where people uh, come from what is now Pakistan into areas like Delhi. And their grandmothers and grandfathers were very old. And in the wake of the 1985-84 anti-Sikh riots after the assassination of Indira Gandhi, uh, which sees again an attack on Sikhs in the same area that we had otherwise seen as and taken for granted as a peaceful area. It's a lot of uh, researchers, especially most notably the pioneer Urashi Butalia, uh, uh, went and did their work. And when you read, and Urashi actually produces verbatim large chunks uh, of the interview, interspersed with what she was thinking. And she makes this point, and it's very clear from the way she's presenting it, that there are questions that even when you have a perfect rapport, uh, you cannot really extract. Extract is the right word. Extract is then the wrong word uh, for the historian. So, so that has been a kind of a, uh, you know, uh, uh, broad survey. One, if I may take one minute, Jelena. Uh, 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 can you hear me? Yes, sir, of course. Uh, can I take two minutes again? I'm going to short my limit. May I? Yeah, because I'm, I'm going to um, just uh, uh, say one thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm quoting the great... Historian E.J. Hotsbaum, Eric Hotsbaum, that I also grew up uh, reading about the notion of the historian as the whistleblower, right? Who says, well, what is this idea about the past is wrong. So as, and there can be no discussion because what you believe is wrong. Uh, that, or oh, it might be a belief, but that belief is not correct, or that's, that doesn't make sense. As Hotsbaum uh, says at one point, either Elvis Presley, the great pop singer, is alive or he's dead, you know, so that, you know, uh, there is a palpable fact, uh, and you can't say, no, but I believe, but there is, I don't want to get into it, uh, a large number of people who don't think so. But anyway, what I'm saying, I want to end on this because it has a bearing on, on our, our, our situation is, that it's okay as a historian to say what you think about that part or that event uh, is not what is fully the case with it, that you have manipulated it, that you have contorted it uh, in a particular way that is suitable uh, to you. Therefore, I am giving you uh, what happened. But the point is that in actual social interaction in society, it is not only what happened as proved by an authentic you know, record of, of, that, of that process in the past, but how people remember it, how people retail it, uh, tell it, how people you know, imagine it, uh, that becomes uh, an important uh, force uh, when we are talking and discussing uh, past events or past movements. So, in, in order to avoid this pitfall, when people are saying, well, that might be your history, but this is my past. We have to take that seriously rather than saying, well, your past doesn't make any, has no place in my history. But that past impacts the present in such a way that your historian subsequently might be writing about the impact of that past in the present. So that I'm, I'm then ending on a very uh, uh, kind of a uh, delicate, uh, not delicate, uh, uh, precarious note. And you know, I really, but we want to on this that when it comes to beliefs or perceptions of the past, the historian cannot simply put hard evidence and say, "Well, 
don't believe then now rolls away because this is a big stone of fat that can make that go away. It doesn't go away like that because there are beliefs uh, that are retailed, that are reworked, and if they are about the past, it is the business of the historian to deal with ideas of the past as well as well as what actually happened in the past. So that's how uh, getting out of the archive is in that sense very, very palpable, right? The archive says this doesn't hap didn't happen this way, but people talk about it. And rather than saying it's wrong or it's no fact, you, you can then see what are the elements of that event that have been reconceptualized in the very process of its being transmitted over or what. And, and that is different, and I want to end, in having a sociological or social understanding of different kinds of beliefs. Hmm? You are of a particular community, therefore you do, or uh, this. So because that really you know, reduces it to a, a, a situation where what who you are is that. That might be an important part of it, that why you are believing or why you believe in a particular way uh, about past, because you know you belong to a group or whatever. But that is not the end of the story, because for the historian of the past, about past beliefs and their transmission through time, it is equally important to actually in, go and investigate and show you know, what, how is it that that fact gets snowballed and that gets accumulates uh, kind of a meanings in a way that don't, on the face of it, make sense, but they are there perhaps because they have been knitted together in a particular way, uh, which is not the way that uh, we as individuals might uh, think that happened, but in order to deal with the past as it impacts the present, we have to really engage with uh, not only hard facts of the past, but how memory plays on the certitude of that. Uh, you know, how memory reworks things or how identity reworks uh, things in, in ways uh, which might not be quote unquote factually true, but which must be part of our new histories, not only of what actually happened, but also the beliefs about what happened and the configurations that made those beliefs long living over a period of time. And that, as I've said, uh, to my mind, is best done by first going into the archive and then marching, not with bidule and bands and so on, but going out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry um, I've gone on uh, for so long. Am I audible? Yes, sir, absolutely. You were audible. Okay, so what do I do? I just mute everybody or they will unmute themselves because it, it's all... Uh, so the you 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 are you, you are flashing so you 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 unmuted your mic so 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 I'll 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 end there and and you take over. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, copy. So we have come to the end of the keynote address. It was indeed a very enlightening session. He has actually asked us, asked all of us, to be very critical about the stamp of authority that each and every source would have with them. He has also told us the importance of asking questions, however limited answers you might get from them. Also, he has pointed how important it is to engage with the subject, no matter his personal limitations might be. Listening to you, like before we open the session, to discussion with the questions in the chat box. I was, as a novice in the process of uh, historical research, I was very curious to ask you, what, what are the constraints of a historian in dealing with the excesses that these new sources would come up with? Say, all kinds of excesses I have in my mind, linguistic, aesthetic, all of them. Excesses. How, yes, sir. Excesses. Exaggerations and excesses that the new kind of sources might have with them. Mm -hmm. How would you comment on that, sir? Yeah, let me 
let me be uh, slightly perverse about it and say that uh, do you mean to suggest that the older kind of sources don't have access? They do as well. No, but that's not my answer, right? Uh, you know, what about the racial excess that most writings uh, on, on nationalist movement uh, by the rulers has, right? This is a stereotypical uh, uh, description of, of the native. So, but you know, that's not that's not what you are uh, you are really asking. So the excess, uh, you there are two ways of looking at it. One is, uh, and I don't want to make a fetish of it, but let's do the play over here. That shall we say the historian uh, with a new uh, new perspective, allegedly new perspective that you think I may be. Uh, advocating, so uh, uh, and and a person. So the notion of excess is depends on what is it. Where does the statement which seems an excess um, comes from? What is the perspective from which you or I sorry I say? Well, this statement about that path is an excess. There is an embroidering of, of this. Uh, so the idea is that uh, the noise, shall we say, uh, and this can be both in writing as well as oral, right? You may write something about the past, which is it just is, 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 is shining with, with excess. Uh, and you say, and then, then what do we do with that? Do we reduce it by 30%? Uh, do we say that since it, statements about the past in order to be usable by the historian should be completely anesthetized, it should be uh, right, uh, detailed, uh, shall we say, that all the excesses should be removed and then the historian can enter? Or how do we do that? Or we should rely on people who are known not to be, uh, not to be indulging in excess. So, you know, it, it depends. Uh, I'm not being relativistic over here, you know, so that this quest for uh, non access uh, uh, in newer kind of statements uh, uh, is uh, really uh, uh, takes away to some extent, not entirely, takes away to some extent the ground from which this new kind of history uh, is being researched and written, you know, because to accept that, you know, uh, the, the recall uh, of an event which happened many, many years ago would not have these sometimes fantastic uh, or imagined uh, 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 aspect uh, is to uh, not take uh, the, the notion of memory seriously. We are dealing with memory, which often, very often, deals with excess. Nobody can reproduce uh, past events in exactly uh, the same way uh, one. So that there has to be a space where what seems excessive uh, can then be part of your telling the story, which is otherwise, you know, relying on uh, material which you think uh, is not is is purely uh, devoid of all excess. So that you will might have to, you know, kind of relate one kind of excess with perhaps another kind of excess. That may or may not happen, but you know, relate to the relate to relate to the difference or relationship between something that appears as without any excess and and something which is excess, because then we can talk about it in terms of the same event uh, that is uh, that is uh, that is being uh, described, or perhaps you know, uh, it's a valid uh, uh, enterprise to. To write something, and you can think about a, a project. To write thinking something which is about excess, the excess of memories of violence, of partition in North India. Then you have to do a very very difficult exercise, where you have to establish the sheer facticity of what happened hmm, in a riot or you know dispossession or whatever it is, and the way. It is remembered. So one way is to keep unpeeling, as it were. You get to the uh, real core that these are the excesses, 
and when we remove them, get rid of them, this is what actually happened. But if you are looking at experience, then it's a tricky business because you are saying your this experience was what was the experience on such and such date in August 1947 in Delhi of somebody who had come uh, from from Punjab, and 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 then but the uh, that fact is is true to that extent. You have a police report saying that you know this neighborhood uh, no not that kind of violence uh, took place and you can establish that but if in the memory of a 70 year old it seems that the violence in the city was so overwhelming that even areas which perhaps were not touched he or she thinks that they were touched then this is an important datum for the historian to relate the facticity of violence of partition to the memory of that which is uh, 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 which would, which cannot be ruled out as this is not history. That's how what I'll, I'll say. So the excess, uh, you know, I'm not making a big uh, song and dance that we should really go for the excess and uh, real history lies in the excess. Somebody might say so, but then you know we have to look at the argument. We have to look at the evidence that is being put across as excess and evidence that is not excess and how you are marrying the two together and what your story is. Absolutely so. Thank you. But one, uh, one, one absence of access is statistics, right? Huh? One absence uh, which kind of a, gets rid of access is statistics. So many people, so many people. Yeah, but it, it how you count and how that's recorded. Sorry, I mean, uh, you know, obviously there are others uh, and perhaps this answer is not very satisfactory, but uh, uh, yes, I mean, if, if I'm advocating new ways of, of, of writing, then uh, there would be questions that, you know, I have no straight answer uh, for. Thank you for the answer, sir. Uh, let's move on to the chat box. Uh, we have a question from Abu Bakr. He's asking how social memory is related to the concerns and interest of community identities in India. Is it a threat or possibility for Indian democracy? Social memory related to community, community, uh... community identities. Mm -hmm. He's asking if it is a threat or a possibility for the Indian democracy. Mm -hmm. Social memory. Uh, as opposed to national memory, I presume that there is a way in which, uh, and I, I presume that this question comes from the fact that uh, this is a recent phenomenon uh, that we are uh, uh, experiencing, that somehow or the other, uh, earlier on, uh, perhaps under the uh, overall enveloping uh, fold of a kind of a national uh, accommodation, differences sorted out at a national level. There was social memory, but that was not subversive. That didn't really subvert uh, you know, uh, other uh, memories that didn't really assert itself in such a way as to leave uh, the possibility of, of of existence of memory or, or, or questioning memory of other groups. And also that the newer development is such that set of assertions of social memory, which I take it is group uh, memory because identities are uh, normally thought in terms of group, smaller or bigger. And you can go from uh, you know, a, a kind of a sectarian uh, to a communitarian, uh, to a provincial, uh, to a national. So uh, the possibility has to be uh, in the realm of politics, I'm afraid, right? The possibility or the threat is in the, in the realm of actual politics uh, rather than history writing to some extent uh, uh, is, uh, feeds into uh, a kind of politics. In fact, there is a criticism uh, 
more widely present now that history writing has done away uh, with social identities. It has suppressed social identities of particular sorts in order to, uh, uh, to write um, a kind of a uh, well uh, syncretic saga of our past history. Uh, and uh, now uh, more, uh, uh, more immediate, uh, more restrictive, but very widespread social uh, memory uh, is um, the best possible ways of having a national identity. Uh, that could be an argument, uh, but, uh, and that therefore historians are, 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 are not helpful. In fact, they have been complicit in denying uh, uh, the fissures, uh, the, the cracks uh, that were there uh, in the past. And by papering that crack, they have created uh, a kind of a, uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, well cemented identity, but you know that was the product of their writing. But in actual fact, this has not been the case, right? I mean, I put it in a in a very broad uh, kind of way, which you know gives uh, you know a new twist to what I said about the inheritors of event that certain social groups or individuals within the social group today are our inheritors or are directly impacted or consciously uh, aggrieved by events uh, of 100,000 years ago, of, of which happened to people like them. You know, that's how you can make this jump of connection, that this happened to this kind of group. I now am, and I'm very sure about it, that I belong to this uh, group, and there is a way in which almost by uh, across the remoteness of time, I can feel aggrieved about what they must have felt or what they wrote. Now, this uh, is uh, a, a st sentiment that could be wide, wider, widely uh, propagated, uh, or whether can whether the historian can write uh, now, no, we're not talking about the story, we're talking about uh, possibility of, of India, so that in some ways, historian is only partly uh, contributing uh, to that. But, you know, they, they, they what, what uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, let me put it, the historian can write histories of a newer sorts, which are, uh, a, a kind of a history which deals with certain um, uh, violence, uh, uh, suppressions of the past uh, uh, in a way which shows the, the malleability of that past, that that suppression was not uh, complete, that that suppression or that violence was part of the normal violence of society, not only against a particular community, but very widely, so that those are, so that there is a way in which perhaps the perfect identity across time of community uh, is historicized, if that's the right word, uh, by painting a much more complex and actually based on research um, uh, picture of, of that past, uh, which was past in its pastness, which was a medieval past or an ancient past, where you know uh, things uh, happened differently, and to expect that that them not to have happened differently is to think that there is a continuous uh, uh, move from past uh, to the present uh, to the future in your case, which is uh, not 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 the case from a historian's point of view. Well. The historian may, uh, or he or she may write it, uh, but politics, uh, actual play of politics, of class forces, of caste forces, and so on, might just uh, might uh, 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 make it uh, irrelevant for the time being. But 
you know, uh, as a historian, I, I, the answer is of a historiographical nature. The real issue really then uh, boils down uh, to the actual uh, play of politics, in my view. Thank you, sir. We have a question from Nidhan, who is an MPhil scholar in the department. He's saying, the historians perceive sources in a hierarchical order, often categorizing them. Oral sources are placed in the bottom of this hierarchy. Why? How this categorization and hierarchy influences the knowledge production? Is there anything like privileged and unprivileged sources? Okay, lots of things in this. Uh, bottom of the hierarchy. Yeah. Um, uh, when you, uh, it would, let's, um, again, that in, in mainstream history writing, this is the case, but you could have completely uh, new, uh, uh, newer kind of uh, history writing where, where memories of groups or oral uh, accounts of those groups are put in the front, uh, and those are. I mean, I'm 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 reminded of, you know, say the work of people, you know, who are uh, writing absolutely uh, new and very very powerful, and therefore very uh, um, from the point of view of dominant group disturbing. Uh, histories uh, of the past, especially of groups, uh, which put oral for sources or, or remembered uh, accounts right in front and, and, and question uh, the hierarchy precisely in the sense that these are very, very important, have been very, very important. But the dominant way of hierarchizing sources as such, that they have been put aside or at the most they can be an added uh, attraction, there could be a small chapter at the end. So, uh, yes, I'll agree that in mainstream uh, historiography so far, um, not bottom of the, yeah, you could say bottom of the source, you could, yeah, in a way that's what I'm suggesting, because what Lord Curzon, as it were, wrote is at the top, and then the provincial governor, and then the district officer, and, and then, you know, a local newspaper, perhaps, and then uh, what you get out uh, by going into that that, uh, that area or talking to people over there. Uh, so um, oral sources at the bottom, yes, but uh, again, Portelli has some very provocative uh, notion to say. He says that all, all evidence is actually oral, you know, uh, or remember, you know, when they look at the term first information report, Hmm? What gets written is what is being said. So it's an oral representation of what has happened out there in that village that becomes the first information report, which is the writing, the the, the writing of the oral is what is the first top, it is at the bottom, but it's the most authentic quote unquote information on that event. Uh, if you, uh, uh, <clears throat> there are accounts uh, of an interaction, say, with a, uh, with a subordinate a group, a rebel, and so on, uh, then the writing of the report of that conversation is the writing of what was oral. So that what gets written uh, is not, you know, it's not a tablet that is given, you know, as it was given uh, to Moses, you know, uh, from from heaven, those writings uh, have a relationship uh, to uh, oral uh, presentation. Unless you are talking about the writing of a diary, mm -hmm. even there, you know, you are recounting oral conversation. But the the really striking example uh, that um, Portelli uh, provides of uh, uh, the writing itself uh, being the fact is when you write a check or when you have a marriage certificate. Mm -hmm. Writing of the check is the event. There is no oral uh, you know, business to it. 
So in, unless there, are, there is an immediacy to what the writing itself achieves, uh, to a large extent, uh, there is orality. But why are they at the bottom uh, of uh, the, uh, the hierarchy is uh, because uh, memory is uh, seen to be unreliable, oral is not authenticated, uh, uh, while what is authenticated uh, or what is really hard might be just the writing of the oral. Uh, so, uh, so I, you know, it's a, uh, uh, it's the task of uh, newer uh, generation of historians. Me, I'm not counting myself. You know, in the newer generation. I was born uh, in the middle of the last century. But for the newer uh, generation, for the newer workers, to uh, question that uh, dominant way of ordering uh, of uh, sources. Uh, uh, but you know, you you cannot. Uh, the historian cannot go about creating her or his own sources just as he pleases. That, you know, uh, there is a way in which you can, you can dig out oral, oral sources, talk to people whom nobody else talked to, uh, or look at um, uh, songs or, 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 or folk narratives in ways in which they were not... Uh, incorporated in historical writing, which are seen only as ritual or only as fancy uh, tales. Uh, so, you know, it depends on uh, uh, what you are looking for and uh, what you do. Well, I'll just take one minute there. I'm reminded of the work, major work by uh, a person called Gyan Prakash, who worked on the bonded laborers uh, of a part of North India uh, in, in Bihar. Uh, and, uh, and, and and he took uh, on board uh, either the songs that were you know sung at marriage or uh, the way people you know made sense of extraordinary occurrences uh, like falling down or, or getting hurt or something being stolen in terms of and of the power of particular beings, Malik Devtas, they are called. In fact, they are the Devtas of the Malik, who are considered Devtas of the Malik by the Kamyas, by the subordinate, uh, because the, 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 the domination of, of the subordinate group is not only physical or economic. It is in terms of conceptualizing and in, in capturing their, in, their, even their thoughts, which can only be expressed in terms of the dominant uh, ideas uh, of uh, uh, of those dominant groups. That's why they are called Malik Devta. The idea is that even if the Malik is not there, you know, there is something so powerful is the authority of the Malik that in his absence, there is something else uh, that is controlling you or that is uh, supervising you. So that if you fall ill or if there is some calamity, you will then reinterpret it because of the power of that ideology in terms of your having disobeyed something or the other of your uh, owner or of your master in the past. So that, you know, that is a, a way of actually taking out oral uh, traditions or oral uh, narratives in a way that they, they actually come out and interrogate the the dominant one. Like this one more uh, example uh, that I think I uh, I could uh, uh, put uh, forward is this: that uh, the uh, say in North India largely there are people who are bonded laborers because caste because of their caste they are not allowed to own land. And there are high caste who own land but will not touch the plow. Hmm? Uh, so that's why they are called harvaha or plowman and, 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 and so on. But when you look at the folk uh, heroes of these uh, people uh, or, uh, or uh, 
then the hero would be such uh, who would relate to the plow, but the plow would not be touching him. It would be hovering over the, over the shoulder. So there is a way in which that kind of an account in histories of those groups sees how that power, which is come to understand through oral interviews and so on, of the dominance is being over, overcome, not in terms of a perfect ideology of equality and so on, but within the terms of the discourse of, of power. Or to take the idea that uh, bondedness uh, in North India in many cases uh, arises at the time of marriage, that you take a loan to get married, to set up a household, which would be at the service of the landlord. And the whole lo loan is such which is not supposed to be paid. That loan is the initial act of, of, bondage, uh, of bondage. And in many of the, uh, at the time of the marriages or accounts of the heroes, uh, the low caste heroes of these groups, uh, the hero actually is one who goes for marriage by capture, you know, which is the chivalrous uh, way in which uh, the groom actually uh, attacks uh, uh, a party and takes the wife uh, away. It's the it's a military. Uh, it's a capture. Uh, so while the marriage of the of the uh, bonded plowman is is conditioned on this loan. Uh, which is not to be paid, which creates this dependence. The heroes are just uh, the reverse of that. Uh, and, and this is, we don't see this in rituals, at least in North India. It's so common. That's why the groom comes on a horse. That's why he's carrying a sword, you know. So even today, or in, on a chariot, even today in the way those are, the marriage rituals are, are worked out, it is, it harks back to this male uh, idea of marriage by, by capture, uh, which was not available uh, to the bonded because marriage is conditional of, on, on previous subordination. But when the reversal of that takes place, the appropriate elements in their oral culture from the, higher, uh, uh, from the hierarchical order. So, you know, uh, it depends on, uh, you know, so that I've gone on and on. So in terms of the established dominant uh, historiography, this oral is at the end. Well, if you want to put it right in front, then you have to do a very good job uh, and uh, show uh, how this actually eliminates uh, the story or the facts or the, uh, uh, or the phenomena uh, that you are interested in. Thank you, sir. We have two questions from Abdul Rahman Kadi. Mm -hmm. How do we resist the communal and fake interpretations of Hindutva against those shared spaces of India? How do we resist? Yes. How do we resist? Historians, I presume, that's what we are discussing. Right? So yes, I'm, sir. Uh, yes, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, how do we resist the communal and fake interpretations of Hindutva against those shared spaces of India? Hmm. Uh, in a way, it relates to something that I said either on my own or in response uh, to Oh, yes, uh, in response to the social memory uh, relating to uh, uh, community identity, right? It's, uh, I mean, I see this as, uh, you know, uh, another way of <clears throat> posing uh, uh, the same uh, issue. And there it was purely in terms, I mean, it was talking about the political uh, uh, idea. And I talked about how politics is important. This is uh, really addressed squarely uh, to uh, historians. Um, and I, I, I'll just go back to some of the things uh, that uh, I, I was uh, uh, talking about more generally. Uh, I mean, is uh, the best, I mean, in a way you are saying in effect, 
asking, what is the kind of new ways in which we can write histories about accommodation uh, uh, of, of the past, uh, which is newer because the, uh, the challenges to that are new. Uh, that is to say that earlier on, uh, the particular way of writing about, I'm, I'm, I'm using the word accommodation uh, deliberately because accommodation uh, is based on um, not, some, some, not really an antagonism, but an opposition. Hmm? Uh, so, uh, so that uh, there was uh, a way in which syncretic uh, cults uh, uh, where uh, both communities uh, relate uh, to a particular individual hero uh, uh, and regard him or her as a hero or a heroine or uh, share a, a common space uh, so that, you know, uh, there might be, uh, which is again related to uh, affiliation to two different uh, uh, communities. Uh, and they are in, in the hagiography uh, of some of these saints uh, uh, and so on. There is a, a very interesting play on this of sharing of space so that say in the accounts of the death of this very popular legendary uh, uh, weaver poet of North India, Kabir, uh, you know, uh, the, the body uh, uh, is, uh, is cremated or, or buried, or also there is a kind of a grave as well as, uh, as a kind of samadhi. So, so there is uh, a long history uh, of accommodation. Uh, and I guess what you're saying is that, you know, this is being overwritten. This is being uh, you know, completely uh, thrown away by saying that if there is, if there are two entities which are distinct, then uh, to talk about uh, uh, accommodation uh, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and coming together is to uh, write a, a kind of a um, history which was not true then, uh, which has no use for us now, which doesn't make any sense uh, to us uh, uh, now, because you know that, because we know that those are things of the past, which uh, have been written about in a particular way, uh, but, but they, there are other accounts that were uh, by historians or by others that were not taken uh, on board, or that memories of those places or new ways of now talking about individualities and community are such that they have no use. So do we just go on and, and stress more on syncretism uh, because that is under threat uh, uh, more and more uh, while uh, in, 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 real, uh, in real space, uh, that is being uh, attacked or, or denied more and more. So that would more and more of the kind of history of, of past accommodation, I'm using the word, because it is more pal pal pal. Do we need more and more of that? Um, bring out new material? Uh, or, uh, or we do uh, something else, uh, which is, uh, not uh, fully acceptable at the moment by everybody, even within mainstream historiography, but uh, is all the more uh, reason to do it. And that is the subject of my last book, which is called Conquest and Community. So community is predicated on a notion of, uh, of conquest. And that this is an attempt to uh, write non-sectarian histories of sectarian strife. Uh, should sectarian strife be written only in terms of sectarian ways? Or is there a way in the, is there uh, evidence or is there possibility of writing about conflicts of the past and the emergence of quote unquote syncretic cults as a way of relating to past 
or uh, conflicts. So that it is not that there is syncretism on the one hand and conflict on the other. In fact, syncretism is, is an after, uh, 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 aftermath of con conflict. It's not that there has been a tradition of some people are doing one kind of thing, other people are doing another kind of thing, and they, they come together. This has happened in the past, and there has been violence. There has been strife. And we are trying to uh, see if we can write histories of that uh, past of that strife in, in a way which uh, takes account of that conflict, but as constitutive of the, of the emergence of a kind of a common, um, uh, common personality so that the character of warrior saint is then uh, a, a difficult uh, character because if you are regarded as saint, you should not have been a warrior in a particular context. But these, there are any number of these uh, cases. So, you know, these shared spaces are not necessarily, there are several examples of that in, in the peninsular area as well. Shared beliefs and shared spaces are not about when there was a complete peaceful coexistence, quote unquote, I'm using a modern term, but where, you know, histories of conflict are being, you know, uh, overwritten or over are being accommodated in terms of the emergence of, 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 of saints or cults which have not completely lost their warrior or antagonistic uh, feature. But that is part of the way in which syncretism has been uh, worked out. So, uh, so that's how I'm talking about, I'm, I'm again addressing it as a historian, that should we not should we have, should be only, should we not about, uh, should, not, should we not talk about violence of the past as, as historians uh, who are not committed to just celebrating that violence with an impact on the present? Or is there a space in which violence and struggles of the past uh, can, uh, can uh, be written in a different way by those who are not celebrating that violence of past? but who are looking at it and writing it in, in different ways. Because they, you know, uh, we, we cannot just uh, carry, because we are, especially the medieval past, obviously there is conquest. I mean, what else was medieval uh, or even, uh, you know, early India all about in terms of battles and so on and so forth. Uh, so we have to write histories of conquest uh, in, in ways in which, you know, newer facets of, of that, uh, Come, uh, come about so that, you know, accommodation could perhaps be predicated on a prior recognition of difference. This is a kind of history that uh, is perhaps uh, the more uh, important, difficult, uh, but more important. That's how I feel. Thank you, sir. We have another question uh, from Sushil Kumar. He's asking, how can we use an archive for writing of Dalit history? You don't have to ask me <laughs> about that because there is so much of absolutely uh, cutting edge uh, Dalit uh, history that has also used the archive. Uh, and uh, I mean, in a way, I'm uh, uh, in, if you just walking in and out and writing the history of subordinate groups. Uh, I, mean, I was talking basically about politics, but obviously the structure, the basic structure of subordination in India is caste. So I think that uh, just as the official sources uh, uh, allow us uh, to integrate them in order to write uh, histories or activities or actions of politically subordinated uh, groups. Similarly, uh, uh, Dalit uh, history, uh, uh, meaning uh, some, I mean, it could be completely outside the, uh, the archives. Yes, I see uh, the, the possibility of memory and so on. I think in some ways, Kancha's, uh, Elaya's uh, work uh, is symptomatic of that. But um, I think, the really uh, um, uh, subversive, really important, both politically and methodologically uh, move would be 
for uh, Dalit history questions to open up and prize the self-sufficiency of, of the uh, dominant archive, uh, which really is, in a sense, uh, an archive of domination. But an archive of domination, uh, almost as I was talking about those cards about marriage and so on, huh? uh, uh, is a domination. The, the dominated are not consumed in the very act of domination by the superior, because otherwise there will be no history of subordination. Uh, so that, you know, every act of uh, subordination, uh, of oppression, of violence against subordinate groups, against uh, caste, low caste or outcast or marginalized caste, is also has, a, you know, if you look at it uh, and work through it, has elements with which uh, the history of uh, caste histories can be uh, can be written because one one way is to write histories of castes which have no relations uh, to the history of dominance, but that might be diff difficult. Uh, you can you know, uh, but the the way in which uh, the uh, archives uh, should yield uh, a different kind of history. Uh, would in some ways uh, could be I mean, those are some of the ways in which I have uh, tried to uh, suggest one could uh, go about uh, doing so. Uh, one one more uh, thing about which I had thought of talking about, but I uh, I was running out of time, uh, which is um, uh, you know. Uh, at least in North India, I'm sure uh, in Peninsular India as well, uh, you know, there is movements for caste mobility, caste associations, and so on, especially so from the late 19th century, 1910s, 1920s. And they are very, uh, you know, kind of elaborate, you know, accounting of the histories of these castes, you know, how, uh, you know, uh, the, the Brahmins were great or why the Chatriyas were great or whatever it is. And they have documents, you know, this particular Sanskrit text talks about this and, you know, that particular, uh, you know, uh, poetry or uh, saga talks about our importance and this is continuing. If you look at, if you look at uh, 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 the kind of a lower uh, uh, caste, um, Dalit, yes, even Dalit uh, caste histories, uh, Dalit organizations, uh, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, which are not as you know, revolutionary or as subversive as has happened uh, much later. It's very interesting uh, uh, thing uh, that one could uh, uh, notice uh, that, you know, there are accounts in the past histories of the fall uh, to a lower grade of what they would regard as untouchable or Dalits because they committed some sin or the other, right? You know, pulling the tail of a cow and the cow dies or something like that. So there is, they are, you know, kind of paying for a major sin uh, which happened in the past. Uh, and uh, they might have some texts going back to the 9th or, 9th or 10th century. Who is this? Uh, sorry. Uh, but what, what I find, and that's not, you know, directly related um, to your question, but still I found interesting that the, the way uh, uh, in which some of these uh, Dalit or caste histories uh, <clears throat> get written is to uh, actually work on language. That, you know, this word which has this meaning, hmm, has been given this meaning in a particular way of pronouncing it or a particular word order. So if you reverse it or if you look at it a different way, actually it doesn't prove uh, what the claims are by the higher class. So this is a one way of, of using language uh, to, to assert uh, you know, a different kind of perspective uh, on, on, on the past. But uh, I, you know, uh, I, you know, uh, oral history, or histories of the traditions uh, of Dalits uh, is a very, very important uh, part. If you want to call it oral history or oral traditions, of course they are central. But 
The archive is also there because the archive of domination has a space which can be rested of the archive of the dominated within that because domination by definition uh, uh, presupposes you know, uh, a group that is being dominated. So the history of domination, uh, the reverse of that is, is, is to try and excavate of the history of the, of the dominated. And uh, in, in some ways, uh, that is a difficult uh, job, uh, but uh, it's, it's been done uh, uh, for other uh, non-Dalit uh, issues, which are obviously, uh, the, that's a structural problem. For instance, histories of nationalism in India have been written to a large extent also on the basis of official documents, uh, because that a census report, a censor report, or a police report, or a rare everyday administration report, uh, is an attempt to curb the presence of the Indians, so that the archive of broadly speaking, the archive of domination, by definition, has a space for reading it in such a way as to create spaces for a history of the dominated, uh, for the history of the oppressed, for the history of the of, of Dalit. But of course, there is a whole universe of oral tradition, oral history, which had been looked down at by mainstream uh, uh, history writers or within the idea of evidence, somebody said about the hierarchy lower, lower down, is because you know that is seen as a preserve of a purely anthropological, a purely religious uh, kind of inquiry. Huh? Uh, but the, the real innovation, the real challenge of newer kind of histories uh, that I see coming uh, within the Dalit uh, historical, historical sphere is precisely to appropriate the, uh, or to, you know, kind of cut at that division that, you know, this is, you know, this, does, this doesn't count as historical material. This is ethnography. This is religious. Because, you know, the popular mind is not like a faculty of humanities, right? Where departments are kept at separate, that divinity is one, politics another, sociology is another, anthropology is there. The mind, the popular mind, has, you know, you know, lives, is constituted by all the different spheres that we identify in social sciences at different, you know, areas of discipline. And so to say that, no, 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 you, you know, this is religion, and how can you raise religious issue archives for, for writing a political history? You know, you, you actually look at political histories to find out and write about Dalit history. I Meaning this is uh, a way in which uh, to really uh, subvert or just uh, you know skip uh, the challenges that are being posed to mainstream historiography by uh, newer waves, which has been going on for quite some time, of 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 uh, Dalit history. Thank you, sir. We have Dr. Tanu Parashar from uh, JMC University of Delhi asking. I have worked on history of incarceration and have one thing to ask you. That Sorry, how... on Sorry, let me uh, incarceration. Yeah, yes. so is that demands or something like that, or, or prisons in India, whichever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, how will you differentiate between a work of pure chronological way of writing history, and on the other hand, a thematic way of dealing with one's topic of research? What are the parameters of dealing with the later? Uh -huh. um, uh, so that the chronological uh, in, 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 in a, one could say uh, would have a beginning, a middle, and hopefully an end. Uh, that uh, uh, so, if you are working on the Andamans, uh, you know there would be a time when these become uh, penal uh, colonies. Uh, particular kind of uh, people are sent over there. Uh, they they do a particular kind of work. Uh, subsequently, the regime of perhaps surveillance is lessened, or more political prisoners go. And subsequently, you know, with 
decolonization will end, that becomes a tourist uh, spot and that history uh, more or less comes to an end. That's So if you're talking about um, chronological view of incarceration, uh, I presume uh, one could uh, uh, think about that. Within India, uh, perhaps, again, you could have a sort of teleology that earlier on, you know, prison discipline uh, was very harsh in some ways. Now, in some ways, you know, it's being, you know, softened, uh, yet incarceration is a very, very uh, debilitating uh, experience. So, you know, whether you want to, uh, you know, so that in a way, if you think through it, I'm thinking out aloud now. I'm not really giving it uh, much thought. But in a way, um, the chronological history would be a history of measures, histories of orders, uh, or histories of uh, modes, where it's the history of authorities. Hmm? That earlier on, this was the prison discipline that was asked for, this was the regime, which were, and then slowly, you know, there's some kind of a movement either within uh, the broad uh, sphere of penology, uh, uh, you know, which people have talked famously about uh, in, in Europe in the 16th century and so on, and, and, and what happens. So it becomes a history of policy to some extent. It can become a chronological history, what, which is not a not a history of policy if we get material uh, and material can be gone, I presume, which is uh, uh, which over a period of time um, is the experience um, recorded somewhere or in, in oral accounts of people who are prisoners over a period of, of time. Or you could even at a stretch uh, think about, say, novels uh, uh, or, or, or tales, songs about what life in prison in a particular area for a particular set of crime is over a period of time. So you can look at, so that chronological then is largely is a state sponsored huh? because those are policies which affect uh, the daily life over a period of time. But one could still have a chronological focus and, and look at the chronological uh, production of very different non-statist, not non-policy uh, um, movements. Uh, one topic, of course, uh, one theme that is, uh, would be an important entry uh, and how one could then argue that despite the fact that there are so many other changes taking place, in that unity that you could call uh, incarceration. This particular element uh, carries on more or less unchanged, uh, or uh, so that is the topic that uh, despite passage of time, keeps on asserting itself as a very, very important constant uh, and could be position of women. It could be, uh, you know, uh, a particular kind of inside incarceration for particular kinds of quote unquote crimes, or the notion of, which comes up in 1870s of what is what are called criminal tribes and criminal caste, that there are some caste and tribes that are inherently crim criminal and their incarceration or their, their surveillance has to be constant, even when they are not actually committing, you know, overt acts of, uh, of crime. So uh, I guess uh, uh, in some ways uh, it, in terms of sources, in terms of uh, normal material, you will get large number, a, a good deal of the uh, sources or archives would be chronological um, because they will be, shall we say, during the colonial period and uh, an annual report on the administration of prison, right? Which will talk about all sorts of things, kind of criminals coming in, uh, you know, allowances, act of indiscipline, attempt to, you know, take care of their religious, uh, you know, observances, etc. over a period of time, that how from harshness. So they are an annual recounting of what is changing, what is constant. So there is an inbuilt, in terms of official sources, a push, uh, uh, move 
uh, which is uh, which uh, the historian, uh, the researcher faces first. That every year is changing, or every ten years. So that that basic uh, uh, theme of history is how things change. Uh, uh, is when histories are basically about change. Very difficult uh, to write about histories of constants, uh, which is relatively new because. Uh, uh, so, uh, so if you take one topic, I I, I really don't know uh, what that topic uh, could uh, uh, could be. Um, then uh, you know it would it would be also interrogate uh, why this topic which is constant, is not commented upon uh, every year because it's so constant, or why it is so important precisely because it is not commented upon uh, every year. So you then get somewhere evidence about this importance of something that is constant, which is not part of the normal recounting or chronology of the life of physics. So it depends on how you want to, <clears throat> sorry, uh, talk about the topic uh, and the chronology because uh, both of them are in effect related. Depends on the, the, the chronology is also about particular topics, and and uh, one topic, uh, if it has a chronology, uh, that would have a different chronology from the uh, the normal uh, recounting every year of what prism is. Thank you, sir. We do have a couple of more questions. Uh, okay. Uh, Thomas is asking. Uh, he wants to know your take on the emergent phenomenon of internet as an archive. He's asking if it's is it good for the subject of his uh, As Shiva would know, I'm totally digitally challenged. So you know, I'm the wrong person. Uh, uh, to uh, really uh, uh, talk about it, but it, it, it does democratize uh, access. Uh, I mean, I'm not talking about, I, mean, I have no experience of uh, blogs uh, as a source, uh, but I'm talking about uh, the sense of the archive, archive as a building. Uh, you know, you have to come to New Delhi uh, and stay in some third rate accommodation uh, to be able to see a file or uh, private papers, of course, uh, it, you know, there is a place where they are uh, uh, kept. Uh, and so uh, digitizing uh, uh, is good, provided it is democratic. Unfortunately, uh, in, in rare cases, uh, the, uh, there is a way in which I've always felt this, meaning I, I, I spent a long period of time um, uh, in England and I was uh, very fortunate because I could mine the archive there and come to Eastern UP and try and undermine it. Uh, but there is an unequal uh, access uh, that the internet uh, is, uh, is, is creating. Uh, so that uh, if uh, rare material is digitized uh, by people or universities or institutions that have the resources. Normally, rather than making it available as a public good to everybody, ideally, uh, uh, that is not how it happens. Uh, it would then be located on a server in a very important, rich American universities. And it would be available for free consultation on the part of a consortium. Uh, a set of universities who have subscribed to this uh, digital uh, or internet source, uh, which will not be available to, in fact, the area or the people with whom it is basically concerned. So, you know, I myself have been involved in um, getting things digitized uh, for uh, these big uh, universities. Uh, but uh, with the uh, express understanding that it would be freely freely available. So uh, so that it's only if things are freely available that individual or, or group or national efforts at making uh, things available on the net 
actually then creates a level playing field. Otherwise, it remains as unlevel as, as it was earlier on. So I'll just give an example that I was uh, totally involved in. See, there was this big linguistic survey of India that was done uh, between 1880s to 1920s. Unfortunately, I don't know, uh, for purely for peculiar reasons, it didn't include uh, the Madras presidency. So, you know, I'll talk about North India again. And it was a very, very uh, detailed survey. I, I don't want to go into it. Uh, several volumes about different dialects and so on. But they also produced 248 gramophone records of people actually speaking, and this is 1920s, in those dialects uh, into the old style 78, 78 and a half RPM uh, gramophone records. I mean, I, I knew that these records existed. I was working, and I'm still working now on the linguistic survey, but I knew that these records existed, but they didn't, I couldn't find them even in the British Library, in the India Office Library, till I chanced upon it. Uh, and they were incredible because, you know, you can really hear people speak, people tell stories uh, in those dialects. And, uh, and I made a proposal uh, to an American university. I said, you will get the funds, you digitize it, but it should be freely available. Uh, it's especially in India, because, you know, these are all minor dialects, uh, you know, the people who can really make sense might be living in a district town. He or she is not going to come to Teen Murti or National Archives, even if it's a uh, CD, to read it. Uh, and it is actually uh, uh, fully uh, available. I think we, in uh, who the retired or senior historians in India who are interested in generating a newer kind of research and want to encourage newer work, we should all, you know, uh, you know, put pressure uh, on the richer uh, universities which have access and which have done a commendable job of digitizing, but make it absolutely, uh, you know, certain that they are made uh, uh, freely available. So the internet, uh, if of, uh, which works behind walls, uh, is not my uh, my favorite. So can we end over here? Uh, is it two and a quarter hours or yes, would, uh, uh, five can minutes? Can I can have a, want to end it. Can you just give me a break for five minutes, if you don't mind? Uh, we'll end it then, sir. OK. We can right. end it. We can, we can uh, go to the next proceedings. All right. OK, yeah, it is uh, 6.15. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have a formal vote of thanks. I invite Sanu Titi, a PhD scholar of our department, to propose the vote of thanks. Okay. Sure. Sanu, are you there? Let's, let's just end the way. It doesn't matter. Yes, absolutely. I don't think Sanu is in the yeah. meeting. Okay. Well, it was a very enlightening lecture. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, we did exceed a little bit yeah, from right. the scheduled time. It was a delight to listen to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, I, I pretty much hope that the COVID goes and I actually am able to come to Kerala and be there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. We're delighted to have you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, you all. I also thank all other participants and kindly note tomorrow we'll have the lecture at eight o'clock, not four o'clock. Tomorrow's lecture will be at eight o'clock by Dr. Ruth Vanita from the University of Montana, and she will be talking on recovering histories of sexuality. Thank you so much. Hope to see you all.